Good afternoon and welcome to UMAT TV. My name is Kamal Arpin and today is going to be another um, political series that we are going to have. This will be our sixth um, episode and I'm going to have our current insurance commissioner, Trindad Navarro, who's going to join us and I am going to bring him in. Uh, let's see. And hopefully everyone is able to hear us okay. All right, uh, Trinidad Novara is with us. Um, uh, Trinidad, welcome to our show. How are you doing? Um, we were able to hear you earlier, but I think um, just something just happened. Maybe I wasn't speaking loud enough, but uh, I'm here. It's, it's good. It's good now. Okay. Right. Well, um, it's well good to see you, uh, first of all. Um, uh, you and I, I believe it's been a long time, five, six, maybe seven years ago. It, it's but, been a while. Uh, your first uh, terms, I remember being in your office. And we also worked with your office very closely uh, with um, uh, being a uh, healthcare provider and having a medical billing uh, revenue cycle management organization. Uh, we have a lot of connection. Uh, we, uh, we have to uh, well, we have to reach out to your office a lot. Not a lot of connection, but we have to reach reach out to your office a lot. And and they are helpful. And we do actually um, uh, enjoy working with your team. And sometimes maybe we bother them a little bit more. But today <laughs> it's going to be about you because the elections are coming in 2024, and you are going to run for the third term, right? And yes, sir, I am. Yeah. So you you are in this position already for seven years. Uh, most Delawareans, maybe they already know uh, more about you, but we want to kind of get to know more. If you can just give us some background on you, and then I'll have some questions after that. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to say merhaba. <laughs> merhaba. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to, forgive me if I mess this up, but Adin Abin Trinidad Navarro. So... I, my Turkish friends from the American Turkish Friendship Association tell me that that means, hi, my name is Trinidad Navarro. So if it was, if it was it, poorly done, I apologize. Quite, quite. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, so. yeah, I, I, I tried. So um, yeah, I've been the, uh, the commissioner now for seven years. I really, really love what I do. Uh, for those who may not know me, I was a police officer for 20 years. And I retired when I was elected to county sheriff, and I did that for a term and a half. And uh, to be honest, I um, was looking for a new challenge. Uh, I didn't really like what I was doing because we were selling people's homes in sheriff sales. Uh, and one of the saddest days in my uh, career there was when we had to sell a home belonging to one of my close relatives. And I'll, I'll never forget that uh, <clears throat> one of the investors kind of leaned over and said, hey, that's that's the sheriff's brother. And it really struck a chord with me because people aren't numbers, right? And oftentimes, whether it's in government or um, in other types of organizations, people are treated like numbers and, and not like people. And so when that happened to me um, and my family, I realized that, you know, I didn't have any discretion. You know, I couldn't stop that sale from happening and any of the other 350 sales we were doing every month. So I was looking for something new. Um, I didn't have, when I mentioned discretion, that means I couldn't say no to a subpoena. I couldn't say no to a goods and chattel sale. I couldn't say no to a share sale. So uh, I was fortunate and, and, and blessed to be elected um, insurance commissioner back in, in 2016. And, you know, it's it's been a, a, a lot of fun. Um, I've learned a lot of things and I've helped a lot of people. And, you know, I could tell you, a thousand stories about people who we have helped, but to just kind of, you know, from a health insurance perspective, uh, to give you just one quick story, one that resonates with me and has for a long time. I, I received a call from a lady uh, who said her husband is about my age in his mid fifties, um, who was suffering from uh, colon cancer. And he had undergone treatment about two years before, and they thought that the treatment went well. And of course he went for a, um, a follow-up and they found it, it came back. So his physician had determined that the best course of therapy would be proton therapy. 
Well, uh, the insurance company denied it and, and said that proton therapy was experimental. Well, we all know that maybe at one point years ago, it was experimental, but it has been covered uh, by other insurance companies and uh, it's been a FDA approved treatment uh, for, for some time. So they called me and she was naturally quite upset. And um, we called the insurance company and within an hour, within one hour, the insurance company changed her mind and paid for this therapy. Uh, the family called me back a few days later crying. You know, and uh, it really, it's kind of emotional for me because this person was my age, right? I mean, he was dealing with something that uh, his physician said this was the best course of action. And um, we, we agreed, uh, but the insurance company didn't. So it was that one phone call. And, you know, the thing is insurance companies don't want to be on our bad side, right? So oftentimes, and I know you know this because we've worked with your office, uh, when we call a lot of times, and most often, uh, there's a positive resolution for the consumer. It's not all the time. Um, unfortunately, sometimes, believe it or not, people don't tell us the truth, right? And then other times, we simply don't have jurisdiction over plans like uh, Medicare and Medicaid and uh, state-funded or self-funded plans. So it uh, doesn't mean that we can't try. And so we get calls all the time from people who have either different types of insurance or they have an issue with Social Security, for example. Not our um, jurisdiction, but we can make a phone call for them and we can speak to someone instead of having to <laughs> go through all the prompts and having really real challenge calling one of these large companies. So that's the best part of the job for me is helping people and something that I look forward to doing in the future. Well, uh, definitely your office is very um, powerful. Um, insurance companies, they do not want to get any calls from you most likely. Uh, and that's going to be part of our discussion. Uh, but uh, just so that people have a good understanding of your uh, office uh, duties, um, uh, protecting protecting insurance consumers, regulating companies to ensure ability to pay claims, reviewing, approving, and disapproving rates submitted by insurance companies, which happens every year, uh, prosecuting insurance fraud, licensing insurance agents and brokers, and there are so many other really important uh, task that your office uh, is responsible for. And that's why uh, it makes it really important uh, for us to have an efficient um, insurance commissioner and insurance commissioner's office. Uh, so, and I believe uh, working with your office and um, honestly, um, we, we did not work with the insurance commissioner's office as close as we did with uh, your, your term, during your term. So, um, Many people probably don't even know what um, what your office can actually do. So that's probably yeah. why they don't know. Uh, and that was one of the things that when we met you seven years ago, uh, I realized that we have to really know what's available to us uh, from the business owner standpoint, from sure. the residents. So this is really important. So um, I uh, will actually ask you some um, questions, but I do want to. Uh, bring up one of our issues uh, because you uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, which actually it was one of my learnings from uh, our meeting, uh, jurisdiction and what you are regulating. So I think this is one of my um, uh, issues that as I, as we work with the um, different. Um, companies, uh, different insurance um, providers. Um, now, as you know, value base uh, is one of our main um, uh, focus uh, from the healthcare provider standpoint. So uh, the, the issue that I'm seeing more and more for us is understanding um, uh, what is actually an insurance. So like why I'm saying that is because um, like when we look at Delaware market, so that's about 20 to 22% is uh, Medicare, which is uh, regulated by federal government, CMS, uh, Center, Center of um, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, then we have Medicaid, which is about um, uh, 25 to 30% almost. Um, so that's regulated by uh, the, uh, the Medicaid, uh, the, it's a different department, if I'm not mistaken. So Sorry. then that 
that's, that gives us about 50% of the commercial. But what we find in, in the commercial market is 75% uh, of that is a self-funded employers. Sure, which, like, the state, like the state plan. Yeah. yeah. Which uh, exactly, which leaves your your office out, uh, kind of. So that leaves us a very kind of like small group. Uh, but then, when you look at it, healthcare providers day to day, what you'll see is uh, we have um, uh, we deal with those claims. Just like, for us, it's not. It doesn't matter if it's like uh, self funded or the insu uh, fully insured. For us, it's everything the same. Yeah. And Medicare, I understand. Um, Medicaid, I don't, uh, but also the self-funded. So I have this, um, I start sharing these, uh, some of the business tools that I have. And then uh, one, of them, one of them is playing in the video on the third screen. So uh, this is like a current situation and an ideal state. So then you kind of see uh, the issues on one side and then where we want to be as an ideal state and what are the barriers. So knowing um, how powerful and efficient your office can be, uh, but then also, given the fact today is uh, district ju uh, jurisdiction is going to be applied to a small group of um, plans out there, what can be done uh, so that your office can actually see more than just the fully insured uh, um, populations? Well, what we have done is we're working with the General Assembly to, and this is something that seems kind of silly, but uh, the insurance cards, right? Uh, the insurance card it could be Highmark, it could be a Medicare plan, it could be a state funded plan, it could be a plan that's purchased on the exchange, right? Uh, so we wanna make that clear on the cards for the, for the physicians uh, so that they know uh, if whether it's a, a Medicare plan, uh, you know, so it's their, or a self-funded plan so that when they're, when they're billing, they, they have a better idea of, of how uh, they should be reimbursed. And that, that's, um, that came from visiting with folks from the medical society, trying to determine you know, some things that we could do to, uh, to help not only um, uh, ACOs, but primary care physicians. And you know, it seems like uh, you know, our hospital systems are buying up these, uh, these uh, family care physicians. They're buying up the visiting nurses, the uh, physical therapists. Private then, practices. Yeah, yeah, so private practice are suffering, right? So what one of the things that we did with the General Assembly was pass a bill that is the primary care bill so that folks who, physicians who are in the business of primary care are reimbursed at a higher rate. It was modeled off of a um, Rhode Island uh, initiative so that the, the ultimate goal was to increase reimbursement for primary care for, at a rate of about 12%. And... Um, <clears throat> We are in the second or third year of that now. We'll be entering the third year, and it's been successful, but not to the level that we would like. And you were absolutely correct when you had mentioned the challenges with Medicare and Medicaid and self-funded plans because we don't regulate them. However, I serve on the SEBC, that's the State Employee Benefits Committee, um, who uh, we work with SBO, which is the State Benefits Office, and we are working with them to try to get them um, to come on board with this bill, meaning that they too would be reimbursing physicians at a higher rate. Um, it would ultimately, um, in the beginning, probably cost a little bit more, but we know early intervention, right? And we know that uh, the first steps are either their primary care docs or uh, you know, an organization like yours where the, you diagnose someone early, right? Mm -hmm. You catch it before it becomes, uh, you know, a situation where they have to be hospitalized with a, a cardiac issue or cancer or things like that. So you spend money early to save it in the long run. So it's 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 a challenge to get any bill passed when it has a fiscal note attached to it, right? So we were able to absorb some of the costs of this. We call it the Office of Value Based Healthcare Delivery, um, mm -hmm. and uh, our initiatives to try to hold the costs down uh, while increasing reimbursement for physicians. So how do you, how do, you do that? We do that by um, having some of the larger hospitals take a haircut, right? So that they don't see these significant increases that they've seen year after year after year, so that we can put more money into primary care with the challenge 
of not raising premiums. And I will tell you um, that on the exchange this year, premiums did go up, but it was uh, two to three percent in some cases, as high for the small group as around just under five percent. So uh, it's working. In other words, this the healthcare on the uh, commercial healthcare on the exchange has stabilized. Uh, when I first started, we were seeing rate increases of 20, 30, uh, 35%. And um, it was well, unsustainable. It's about 40, 47 percent actually from our own uh, uh, plans that we have from United Medical. Um, Say that again. It's about 40 to 47 percent increase we have uh, since 2016. Uh, this is for United Medical's uh, health insurance um, and also two of my other practices. So we pay about 40, 40 to 47% more depending on the group size right now since uh, since 2016. But I know that's not related to your office uh, because there, I mean, it is, um, I mean, your office has oversight on that, but uh, the pressure that we get from the insurance companies, from the hospitals is probably pushing that. Uh, but I think you have, a, uh, you actually uh, got to a point of the primary care bill, which, uh, was one of the really uh, best bill for the private practices for primary yeah. care. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that uh, what I was asking you earlier, uh, increasing the jurisdiction, at least for these self-funded plans, because what happens when you have the primary care bill, when you look at it, you actually, uh, I mean, the bill uh, itself is uh, only for fully insured plans. So we actually uh, we work with Brian Townsend. Um, uh, he's been on this show at least and, three, and, four. And David Benz, he was a yeah. uh, representative. So, yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. David Benz, and then there's others. But uh, Brian actually came to us, uh, uh, and then he was part of this show for three, four times. And then one of the things we realized during these conversations is when we were expecting the uh, Medicare. Uh, allowable from other insurances, we realized that it was not the case because the bill it, the bill didn't include the self-funded plans. And that wasn't the bill's fault. That's because of the jurisdiction issue that yeah. it's not overseeing those. So that's why I'm asking, can we actually fix that? Uh, and who do we need to work with to make sure that these self-funded plans are not acting independently? So then they should be treated like a fully insured uh, plans, just like any others. So that's was kind of like uh, where I was trying to go. No, I understand. We would have to change the state law. Uh, and uh, that would be something that, um, you know, Senator Townsend could perhaps uh, look into. I know uh, Representative Dave Benz, who was a big supporter, he has retired from the General Assembly, but Brian Townsend and, and I and my office, we have regular contact with him and, and other folks that are all part of the primary care uh, collaborative. Uh, but, you know, no commissioner in any of the 50 states and the six territories has jurisdiction over these ERISA plans or these uh, this plans like this, this state plan. And that's codified in, in uh, state law. So if we were to try to, and I, and I did watch um, you know, some of the other interviews that you've done, uh, you, know, you can't just change a regulation. The regulation essentially explains the law. So mm -hmm. um, you know, it would require a change in the code. And then uh, we would change our regulations to essentially explain the code to the industry. And, uh, you know, uh, this is one of the things that I was saying before with other interviews, you know, uh, being uh, a smaller uh, state, uh, sometimes it comes with its own advantages. And, and I was thinking that this would maybe one of them where we can, because when you don't have, um, when, you, when the law doesn't apply to everyone equally, and when the expenses are being um, paid by everyone um, uh, equally, uh, unfortunately. So then there has to be some, um, you know, uh, responsibilities um, and ownership and accountability. Uh, and the only way that we can be more accountable if we are able to, we are, um, if the state is overseeing some of those. So, uh, because if the private practice doesn't stay in business, uh, the insurance and healthcare cost is just going to go uh, out of the roof. So, um, but I know we'll be reaching out to you for uh, more maybe detailed um, uh, discussion on this issue because um, I just wanted to kind of see what your 
position would be. Um, and I know last week we have uh, Kyle Evans J. She's running for the lieutenant governor. Yeah. Uh, and she, uh, like, um, from the principal standpoint, she understands the issue just like the way you did. Uh, but I think these things needs to be uh, kind of addressed uh, because um, physician shortage, primary care, family physician, pediatrician shortage is um, is real. So it's not um, it's it's if we leave these to the hospital uh, systems, uh, not only it's going to shortage, it's still going to continue, but it's going to be more expensive. So I'm just uh, here to support our uh, private practices. Now, um, being in this position for seven years, um, uh, there are, I'm sure there are a lot of things that you were planning to do, uh, and some of them you did, and some of them you did, uh, maybe you are planning to do in the future. Mm -hmm. So what are the biggest accomplishments from your point that you have done in the last seven years? Wow. Well, um, <clears throat> we'll start with the exchange. I mean, when I first started, uh, there were, it was Highmark and, and United on the exchange and um, United left. And it's funny that people can uh, blame the inexperienced insurance commission on the fact that they left the state of Delaware. Well, that must be pretty well, powerful. Just know that this United is not us. This United is United Healthcare. So yes. not United. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it was, actually, I'm sorry, it was Aetna. And so Aetna left and they left, uh, it must be pretty powerful because they left every state, right? So it wasn't a matter of, um, you know, the regulation or the regulators in Delaware. It was the fact that they were hemorrhaging, you know, tens of millions of dollars every year. Fast forward to where we are today, we now have four uh, insurance companies offering insurance on the exchange. And in many cases, individuals can purchase insurance at no cost or around $10, depending on their, their financial situation. Uh, we were able to pass a what's called a 1332 waiver. Uh, that's a, a reinsurance waiver that's uh, sponsored by the federal government. Um, <clears throat> and uh, probably four years ago, and within the first two years of that waiver being passed, we lowered premiums on the exchange uh, by 20%. Uh, and so uh, it, it has stabilized in Delaware. And we're doing really, really well uh, with respect to that. Now, let's talk about the other types of insurance. Uh, workers' compensation insurance. For the last seven straight years, uh, workers' compensation insurance rates have plummeted. Um, and last this year, it'll be another year of double digit decreases. So this really helps uh, business owners. Um, you know, sometimes people get confused and they think that if we lower the premiums, the benefits are lowered. And that's not that's not the case. And sometimes we have to make sure that we point that out. But we are uh, successful in Delaware, partially because of our workplace safety program. Um, this this program that we offer can lower premiums an additional up to 19% for people who participate in it. So um, it's only about 11 or 1200 companies in the state who participate in workplace safety. That's one of our challenges and what we're looking forward to do in the future is promoting it so that more companies can, can take advantage of it. But one of the most, um, one of the most uh, important bills that we work with the General Assembly that, that we passed that I'm most proud of was House Bill 80. And House Bill 80 dealt with homeowners and private auto insurance. You see, insurance companies were using data like your credit score um, in, a, in a manner which was unfairly discriminatory. So they were using um, information like uh, your marital status, your employment, your education, your zip code. Uh, I mentioned your credit score uh, or your lack of credit. So they were using all of these things to unfairly discriminate against people uh, because let's, let's face it, if you're a young person, uh, you may not even have credit, right? Or if, you, um, if your spouse has passed away and now you're single, insurance mm -hmm. companies should not be able to charge you more or higher premiums for that. So House Bill 80 um, made uh, all of those um, underwriting initiatives uh, illegal. I will say that insurance companies can use your credit score, but they can use it only to your benefit. So if you allow them to look at your credit score, you could likely lower uh, uh, your premiums. Um, so other things that we have accomplished it has to deal with uh, arbitration. I and mean, we've helped people, businesses alike, um, through our uh, state-sponsored arbitration program. Last year alone, we uh, helped 
people recover approximately $750,000 that went to people uh, instead of to insurance companies. And over the years, it's been, it's been millions uh, that we have helped people uh, recover. So, that, so that's what makes your office really powerful, right? So um, not just because you're able to oversee these uh, plans and insurance companies, but you are actually able to find them. So um, like uh, these are public records in 2021, Cigna got $382,000 fine. Um, American General Life Insurance, uh, $106,000. And I know there are a couple other big ones uh, recently, but these are public records. And uh, that's why it makes, again, my point a little bit stronger. So if this applies to the self-funded plans, yeah. so we can probably have more uh, support uh, because people uh, companies are gonna be worried about these types of numbers. So they don't wanna be fined. So, because I, if I'm not mistaken between Highmark and Aetna, they have, uh, 600,000 in the last two years? Uh, I may be off a little bit. Yeah, yeah we, we did a uh, MAPIA exam. That's the mental health parity exam. And we found that Highmark and the three other large insurers were in, not in compliance with our law. In other words, if you were um, injured and you went to, um, uh, to see a physician and uh, you were treated for an injury, right? Uh, versus if you had a mental health or a substance abuse uh, illness, they were treating you differently. Everything from prescri prescriptions to the, the amount of uh, care needed to the time for a rehab uh, facility, they were doing it differently. And we find them over a million and a half dollars all, all told uh, for those violations. Uh, we're actually, that was about two years ago, we're actually going back now to see if they made the changes that we told them to. And if they didn't, they'll see a significant fine again. So uh, we do hold insurance companies accountable uh, mm -hmm. for filling their obligations. And oftentimes they, when they see these fines, it's not de minimis because it's significant, but they almost see it as if it's a cost of doing business. So the key is the public has to come to us uh, when they have their challenges, right? So um, we did the mental health test or the exam because it was time to do it. But other uh, findings that we found against insurance companies were just generated from people who, for example, didn't get their discount because they had uh, taken defensive driving classes. And we had a person call us and it wasn't applied to him. We did uh, an interrogatory. So we sent information to the insurance company and they're, they're pretty slick. You know, they'll cherry pick certain uh, policies and um, accounts. And but we uh, are able to determine that they weren't giving people their discounts. And not only did they have to give them the discounts, uh, we find them as well. So mm -hmm. um, the key is the public needs to tell us back to your earlier point about what we actually do at the department. Uh, you know, we help people with with insurance challenges. Uh, we don't sell insurance. True. So then what's for the future then? Like, what are the things that you are still uh, planning to do, but you weren't able to do in the last seven years? Well, um, our volunteer fire service is one of our, um, uh, our jewels of the state of Delaware, people who actually volunteer their time, put their lives on the line for uh, people like you and me, whether it's an auto accident or a house fire. And uh, we have been working with them um, over the last several years to address uh, their reimbursement. Uh, we just got um, the volunteer fire service reimbursed at a higher rate for, for their ambulance transportation. Uh, they were being uh, reimbursed at a rate lower than uh, Medicare. So I didn't know, right? There's no way for me to know that. So they, they met with us. Uh, we met with the industry and we got that fixed. And we're now looking to help them with um, a reimbursement for rescue billing. So if they have to remove you from a car because your car was, uh, you know, seriously damaged in an accident. And they have to take these, use these extra materials, these extra tools to extricate you from a vehicle. They should all be reimbursed at a, a, a uniform rate. And what we found is uh, in some cases they weren't reimbursing at all. In other cases, that was uh, only a fraction of what they should be getting. So we have been uh, working with, with uh, the volunteer fire service to do that. We're continuing our work with the, uh, the primary care collaborative because um, you know this is something that it's really important to us because we're trying to uh, maintain and keep uh, primary care docs in business. So one of the things that um, you know is important to us is that 
not only are we uh, getting reimbursement at a higher rate for them, but we're also working with some of the insurers. Uh, they've offered uh, Highmark, for example, $4 million uh, to uh, for grants for, for companies. And we know uh, places like Westside Health who provide a fantastic uh, service for people in the city of Wilmington and uh, other parts of Kent and Sussex County. Uh, they received a significant grant to support um, their day-to-day -day operations. So there's just one other thing, and then there's lots of things that I could tell you about that I want to, I'm planning on doing, but top of mind, I'm the chair of the Anti-Fraud Task Force for the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So we are looking at uh, lead generators, uh, specifically for people who are, are on Medicare. Uh, it's open enrollment period now, so uh, people are getting inundated with phone calls and letters and uh, emails. And in some cases, they're actually knocking on people's doors to convince them or try to convince them to switch to a Medicare Advantage plan, which uh, many cases people don't understand what they're signing up for. Um, so we're looking to put an end to this nefarious actions by these lead generators. Um, the challenge is, and we've already been lobbying Congress to give us state-based regulators the authority to regulate the commercials that you see, you know, the J.J. Walker or the William Shatner commercials that you see on television. They're so misleading for people. Joe Namath. I had one lady call and say, I want that Joe Namath plan. Well, we don't even sell that in Delaware. That was a Philadelphia TV station. But you see, that's what they do. They'll, they, they think that they'll find someone in your past that they loved or they trusted or show you know, that they watch and enjoy, and they think that they can trust these people. And the truth is, I don't think these actors are bad eggs. I just think that the products they're selling misleading, and in some cases, cases damaging to the consumer. So, um, because you mentioned a couple of the um, organizations, so um, one of the issues that I also see uh, for private practices, um, uh, this, uh, issue of being profit versus uh, non-profit, for-profit versus non-profit. So, uh, you know, I have uh, multiple different heads, um, you know, revenue cycle management, medical billing is our core business. Uh, we are an EMR vendor, but also I own uh, a primary care office, one of the probably largest fund right now with 14 or 15 providers. Um, and point of the primary care, uh, the, the reason I ended up owning that, not because I was looking to own them, just because my clients did not want to deal with the business part of it and said, look, if you don't take over, we are going to join the hospital or we are going to retire earlier. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to lose business if I, don't if I don't have to give them a platform so then their longevity of their practice can uh, be extended. So that's, that's why I ended up doing it. But one of the things that always kind of... It's kind of a bitter uh, point for us is like Westside. Um, it's a great organization, yes, but they don't do anything different than what my uh, primary care clinic is doing. Yeah. Medicare, Medicaid, self, uh, I mean, uh, self pays, all, uh, they, I mean, they take all those and we take all those. The only difference is we don't see much support from the state government for, uh, just because we are labeled as for-profit. So yeah. that is, that's one of the issues that, especially with the pandemic, um, and as you may uh, you may know this already, but this channel started because of the pandemic, because we wanted to reach out to the patients and give them another source uh, that can come from clinicians. Like right after this one, um, Dr. Isaiah Erga is going to join us. We have this um, weight loss uh, events, uh, we call them Bariatric Friday. Uh, we have so many clinical presentations. So we have a good, um, solid uh, source of um, safe information for the patients. Um, and everything else that we are doing is almost same. Uh, yeah. In fact, I'll end up doing a little bit more, but we don't see the benefit just because of the labeling. Do you think there's any uh, possibility to look into the healthcare organizations in a different way? Um, so, you know, again, um, since uh, it's a small state, I don't see a problem uh, using some names. So I build a uh, primary care office. I spend um, X dollars. So I don't know if you saw the new Christiana building on 202. That is about 7X. And I know that for facts, so it's actually. 
and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, so I'm just giving an information, but sure. they're able to spend that money. So the ceiling is so high in order for me to hit that, meaning that I have to pay the electricity of that, I have to spend five times more. Like, well, patients don't need more oxygen in the room, right? So like, why do you need like a 12 to 15 uh, feet uh, ceilings? But they have, because they can. Yeah. Their sign itself is so big, humongous. You can see it from the moon. Why? Because they can, they get paid. And then they also get other support. So how can we actually close this gap? So then I don't feel this bitter about these issues. So then I can keep my physicians and providers in business. Yeah, so a couple of questions I have for you. Uh, were you even aware uh, of the, the, the grant opportunities that Heimark was, was offering? I mean, I asked well, you that because you could have applied, um, you know, and what, what before you answer, what Westside did, they used it for like some capital improvements, you know, so that it wouldn't take money away uh, from the monies that were going to the, you know, for the treatment they were using for, for capital things. Um, and so you, I, I don't know if you had the same opportunity as they did. So um, if you are referring to the one from the Medical Society of uh, Delaware, there are some yes. issues uh, with the organization, uh, with the Medical Society of Delaware, because as you know, we are one of the four ACOs. Yeah. So is, so is Medical Society of Delaware. So they are mm-hmm. competitors although they should be like a uh, kind of professional organization that's not a vendor, but they turn into a vendor, which they sell insurance, uh, malpractice, they uh, make insurance um, contracts, and they have an ACO, a carnival care organization with St. Francis Hospital Partnership. So prior to that, in 2014, the reason we couldn't become an ACO because they give the exclusivity, Highmark, to Medical Society of Delaware. Uh, So then, they almost put us out of business. They said either you are going to be joining us or there's not, you know, no no chance for you. I mean, luckily we were able to manage those situations. But um, working through the Medical Society of Delaware is not a viable option for many of the physicians. And I'm actually not just voicing out my my physicians. Yeah. Uh, opinion, but others as well. So it's um, I think they really need to get away from providing paid service. So then they are not a competitor for any businesses. So, because they shouldn't be, they should, it's, it's a society, like medical society. So then everyone should feel like, okay, this is an objective organization, but now maybe they do it because they need more money in order to support the admin. I don't know, but they're in the ACO business. So. Yeah, I, I'd be more than happy to sit down and have these types of conversations with my friends at the Medical Society, with my friends from the Academy Core uh, uh, Care Organizations, with my friends from the primary care uh, practice, uh, because you know there are there are opportunities out there. But to to your point earlier, yeah, the, the hospitals do have a significant unfair advantage, uh, and those hospitals are also nonprofit, right? So they can afford to uh, build these facilities. They can afford to uh, buy these dock in the box shops, and it's really really not fair. That's why um, I'm not sure if your organization is considered a center of excellence or not for for, for surgeries and things like that. Uh, so actually, uh, my uh, surgery center, American Surgery Center on Folk Road, out of nine three hundred surgery centers in uh, in the United States, there are only ten of them have the uh, center of excellence for bariatric, and we are one of those ten. Yeah. So, so I do the, I do this uh, despite the fact that there's Christiana, there's Bay uh-huh. Health all those giants out there. And I'm just like a three OR surgery center and I still have the center of excellence because we are able to, we are able to do that. The thing is, it's not about being, uh, getting paid more. It's about the efficiency. And that's what we see with these, insu- uh, with these insurance companies, then hospitals, they are kind of like their focus is uh, how can we spend more? That, that means how can we charge more? Yeah. So then, 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 then you and I, we, end up talking about how can we control the increasing the cost of uh, medical insurance. So that's uh, uh, what I realized uh, in all these last 23 years in this business. Uh, Every day, every year is a big um, step for us to learn more and more. And there's always something. Uh, There's always something. That's why I want your office to be more powerful to um, 
uh, oversee the TPA, the third party administrator side of it, because there are so many challenges. Like one of the things that I, I want to mention to you, which I didn't know this until maybe three, four years ago, um, there's a term used um, most uh, favorite nation clause. So, you know, I have uh, business and political science degrees, uh, computer degrees, I have two MBAs. And when I hear that, all I'm thinking about is this is a diplomatic relationship between countries. Well, I was wrong. So why? Yeah. Because this is uh, most favored nation clause is used in healthcare, right? So, and if we don't actually have this TPA side of uh, closely looked into, then there may be some, uh, you know, uh, back office deals uh, that's not been visible to us. And then, then we are actually end, end up paying more and more because they have some uh, deals on the back. So, you know, when I, the reason why I asked you about the, the Centers for, for Excellence, because as a member of the SEBC, that's the State Employee Benefits Committee, we are pushing our own um, uh, population to these Centers of Excellence for these types of treatments, because we know the hospital could be five, six, seven, ten times more expensive. You know, if you have to yeah. have... Um, uh, an x-ray, you know, we want you to go to a standalone facility or an MRI or some other procedure because at the hospital, it's just, it's just outrageous. So that's, I didn't know for sure that you owned a, or were part of a center for excellence, but I figured you were because I knew how, how uh, prominent you were in, in Delaware. But so, you know, we wouldn't say, hey, go to Kamal's place, right? But what we would say is don't go to the hospital, you know, because we know the, by, by doing that, we save money for the state. So I don't have regulatory authority over the state, but I'm a part of the benefits committee, the state employee benefits committee. Though. So we make these recommendations to send people to places outside the hospital to save significant dollars to places like Centers for Excellence. So, no, actually, you know, uh, this is a really good conversation because I also want people who listen to us uh, to understand how important your office is. Yeah. Many people don't, like when I say insurance commissioner's office, they're like, what do you mean? Like, oh, we can't actually do this. We, we can file a claim or we can do this on behalf of someone. I'm like, uh, yeah, well, this office actually is not only uh, just there, but it's, it's a very powerful office. And the one thing that insurance companies hate the most is getting that call when they don't do their job. Right, so uh, that's, uh, I think there's more to do uh, together. And that's why also we wanna make sure that when these decisions, uh, these uh, regulations are being made, we wanna be part of it. Because I have, I represent just in Delaware, 180 different physicians providers, nationwide close to 400 uh, from different specialties. Just like this year, uh, the projection total number of uh, appointments is over 500,000. That's about 115,000 individuals in Delaware going through our system, receiving some service from us. And, and I take this very seriously and I wanna make sure that people uh, are um, aware of what's available to them and uh, you know, protecting elderly, protecting kids and protecting those who are in the most difficult time of their life. Because when we need insurance, usually it's not when we are all healthy and happy, it's usually right. when some uh, big issues. And so my last question for today, uh, uh, and then we can cover other things if you like. And I asked this to um, Kyle uh, Ye last week. Um, is there, do you think there's a future for torts reform, medical uh, malpractice liability reform uh, in Delaware, um, just so that we can actually maybe have a, some handle on the increased cost uh, from the healthcare service standpoint? Yes, the answer is yes. I mean, other states have, have done this. Uh, Pennsylvania uh, passed a bill, uh, a tort reform bill. And what really essentially what that means is that the puts a, a cap or a restriction on uh, the amounts that people can sue for. And it can be anything from medical malpractice to a, a, an auto accident. One of the so some of the challenges would be, um, you know, you would have to have uh, some of the powerful people in Delaware to agree to that. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't know that the trial lawyers association, what their stance is on that, uh, I, would, I would like to know, um, but I haven't had a conversation with them specifically. But that is one way to help control the costs of all types of insurance. 
You see, um, in Florida, for example, they had 11 insurance companies that went insolvent last year. Everyone thought it was really because of the, the hurricanes and the large convective storms that were popping up. And that had a big part of it. But one part that folks didn't see was the litigation costs. Uh, you know, the, if you drive through Florida, um, every billboard is, you know, call us if you have an issue with your insurance companies. And some of these companies, uh, law firms were using, were purchasing uh, clicks, computer clicks. So that if you typed in, you know, hurricane relief or uh, insurance issues, would go to their law firm, not necessarily to an insurance company. And so it is a real challenge, not just here in Delaware, not just uh, in Florida, but across the country and across the globe. Um, so, yeah, I think that that would be one way that we could lower premiums if we could get a handle on some of the litigation costs that are associated uh, with whether they're accidents or, or medical claims and any, any other line of insurance. So one, uh, I, I did say last question, but I have my line, actually. I have one That's line. okay. So uh, because um, it's an election and then um, sometimes when we have challengers, you have to go through the primary, which in this case you aren't going, mm -hmm. you aren't going to be. Um, mm -hmm. The person who, I believe there's only one person so far, uh, Coyote um, Abiganda, she was, he was with us two, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, these elections can be surprising. Um, so, I mean, I, I was a close witness of that in 2008 when Jack Markell was running against John Carney yeah. and John was the favorite and uh, was supported by the party and all that. Uh, but then with a very slim uh, margin, uh, Jack Markell was able to get the primary, for, if I'm not mistaken, 1,800 votes in total. So um, do you see that as a challenge um, for 2024? Um, and because it's another uh, Democrat who's running. Uh, so there's always the challenges of how far do you want to go with this, right? So, but what do you think, uh, how you are going to overcome that challenge uh, for 2024? Well, of course, I take it seriously. Um, I, I've met Coyote. We've, we've had uh, coffee. Um, I like him. He's a genuinely good person. Um, and, you know, he... Um, feels as if he's qualified for the position, as do I. Uh, so, you know, it's this is how the process works. I mean, to be candid, I had a primary against the incumbent myself, and I was very fortunate to, uh, to be able to uh, prevail. Um, I think my credentials and my uh, experience and my history um, makes me the right person. But you know, if the, you know, the electorate in Delaware think that uh, Coyote is the, the, the right guy, you know, that's something I'd have to live with. And, that, and that's okay. Uh, that's part of the, the process. And it should be open and it should be fair. And, um, you know, and I will tell you that our interactions have been nothing but positive. And it, that's how it should be. Yeah, you know, I don't think people in Delaware like, like negative. And it doesn't, no one really ever gains anything from that. So, he hasn't said anything uh, negative about me, and I certainly have said nothing, but I have respect for him, and I wish him and his family well. Well, very good. Well, um, uh, Trinidad Navarro was our guest today. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our goal is to bring you guys back in 2024, maybe three, four months prior to the um, uh, primaries. Um, uh, we have, for the rest of this year, um, uh, Cher Walker, I believe she's going to be with us, uh, not 100% confirmed, I'm looking at Sean, uh, but uh, Sarah McBride is going to be with us on November 3rd, and Bethany Longhall, she's going to be with us in December, as well as uh, Lisa Rochester, uh, and then, then we'll start a new cycle for 2024, and we want to see you again, and I know we'll be bothering your office uh, with our other issues on a day-to-day -day anyway. Well, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It's never a bother. Take care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. All right, uh, Mr. Donovan, uh, are you? I am here. Yeah. Uh, your video is off. Oh. <laughs> see if you can see me now. Oh. All right. There he is. Hello, hello. Hello. So we have uh, seven minutes before our bariatric Friday. Uh, last week, we started talking about um, Israel and Palestinian conflicts. Um, 
But before we go to that, and which we won't be able to go too far anyway, uh, what did you think about uh, the insurance commission? Um, so again, very successful session, I think, in my opinion. Um, I think he was well prepared. He's been doing this, you know, for seven years now. Mm -hmm. So he should know the ins and outs of the business, which it seems he did. Um, wasn't, you know, caught up or stumbled on any of the questions. It seemed like he was informed on the topics we were talking about. And I think it's good that he recognized that although he has made certain achievements and accomplishments, there is still other work to be done. I feel like in any position, if you are incumbent, you never want to say you've done everything. Yeah. Because then what's the point? You know, like if you think you've accomplished everything there is, then um, it's not realistic. So uh, I think it was good that he still did recognize there's other things out there that can be attained. Um, and the fact that he at least had a generic approach on how he's going to uh, you know, get to those goals. So um, now because uh, of the time, if we go into the Israel issue, I don't think there will be enough time. And yeah, uh, in fact, six minutes is not a respectable amount for everything. Right. Going on. So, uh, based on what happens next week with um, Sherry Walker, uh, we may be able to spend more time, but I'm just worried that there is going to be too late mm -hmm. because, in my opinion, there are, um, there's, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of uh, uh, terrible pictures in the next uh, several days. Um, and it's pretty scary uh, what's happening there. Um, solution is not easy. Um, and again, in my opinion, I don't think we are managing this situation well. Um, another war, another region, uh, another 100 billion is being asked to provide. Um, you know, the sad part is uh, when Biden was explaining that, he said, well, it's gonna help our economy because we make weapons and our workers are War working those that, uh, you know, just like, you know, in the last three years, every day uh, in Tigray is just like what's happening today in Israel and Palestine. So every day in the last three years is same, but no one talks about it, right? So the hypocrisy is so like loud that people actually uh, like this is one of those times that I'm probably most disappointed with some of the uh, uh, newsmakers. Um, Megan Kelly um, is one of them. There are only a few people who are objectively able to uh, really provide good information, uh, objective sure. news, and how people can be so blind and crazy just for uh, going going after people and killing and killing and killing. This is just, um, this is a sad time for history. Um, so uh, just because our topic is healthcare related, I mean, it's a clinical uh, uh, one and we won't be able to keep up very not too long on that other side. So I want to kind of keep to the, um, uh, not short necessarily, but um, yeah, yeah, we don't want to go into uh, this. Maybe we'll do one in between. Uh, I don't know, but there are so many things that needs to be discussed. Um, uh, and I'm just worried. Yeah, I think a lot's going to unravel, like you said, in the next week or so. So yeah. it's, it's almost just like a waiting game at this point. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes uh, with Bariatric Friday. Uh, as, as you can see, my uh, background did already run out. That means we are already in 57 minutes. So we'll be back uh, with Bariatric Friday and we'll see you guys.